So we know those. that's just kind of a, a natural progression in the church. Any community, uh, any um, body or group or society, uh, even your choir, anytime you have two, two people, often you're going to have two people with two opinions and ideas that are different than the others. And unfortunately, we all think that we're right. And sometimes we're not even listening to the other person's side in the conversation or d- argument. And we become debating and not necessarily, well, we're arguing and not really uh, debating on that to see all sides of uh, possibilities because we've already determined that our side is right. And this is no different in the history of our church because it once again, we're dealing with human beings. Everything that we are doing and, and experiencing, it's with human beings. And we know in our flesh dwells no good thing. So I have here, let's look at um, some of the journeys of Paul. We're just going to look at this map real quick. I took a picture in the book. I said, well, if I'm going to do this, why don't I just uh, get one from the internet so it would be a little clearer so people could see it better. So you see here, let's see, in your bottom, uh, let's see, bottom right, this over here would be Israel. So this would be Ju- um, Judah and Israel, where we know now present day um, Damascus, Syria. Now this area would be Turkey. So when they're talking about Galatia, Galatia is not necessarily one city. It's kind of think of it as, a, as you see here, like like the state, um, maybe a country. Think of it as country. So in this country, you would have the different cities. Then you had Lystra. Um, and you have Iconium, you have Derby, you have Pisidia. So those are some of the towns. You have Ephesus. Now, what we know that area to be now is Turkey. Uh, and we know the conflicts with Turkey, Hamas, everything that's going on there with Damascus, Syria, and Israel since October the 7th. But this is the area, and all of this is the Mediterranean. As you go further east, you go up through the Bosphorus and through this, um, the Black Sea right here, this Bosphorus. This is what um, separates right here Asia and Europe. So this would be the way everybody would go to be able to get up into Europe. Now you're over here in Italy and France, Germany, Rome, and further west and go across the pond, and then you're here in America. So this is the, in the first century of the church. This is the area that they would have traveled, and you see the different routes that they that they had taken. Now remember, this is about thir- this is about between 34 and 74 A.D. This is years before Columbus, before Marco Polo. People have been traveling Egyptian. They they I think they're saying that they found finding Egyptian boats and the sails that they had. They are now finding those off of the coastal waters here in America. So they were travelers. They were explorers. That's what made the human being so different and unique. Um, we have vision and we want to see what could our tomorrow be. And that is makes us different than just any other um, beast in the ground. They don't think of a tomorrow or, you know, how am I going to take care of my family tomorrow? Their needs is just right here. How, what I'm going to eat right now. What can I hunt and fill my stomach with now so that I can rest to live another day? They're not thinking about goals and aims, dreams and hopes. And that's one thing that we do as, as humans. So we travel. Now, let's go ahead and go to the next slide here. As we... Uh-oh. Going too fast here. All right. As we travel, as the dis- dis- disciples began to disperse, um, following the commission of Jesus, they were to go and make disciples, Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So as they are traveling, they're encounter- encountering different cultures, different ideas, different cultures. So now what's going to have to happen is you have to blend and all of this assemble together to have uh, moving forward. What are we going to have as our creed, our belief? So they were, there's continuity in everything that we do. As I was sharing Sunday, if I go to a KFC in Tennessee, it's going to taste exactly like the Kentucky Fried Chicken in the state of Washington. The McDonald's in North Dakota is going to taste like the McDonald's in Houston. That recipe, that grease, that formula is exactly the same way. And those are something when you commercialize things, there's no deviation. 
not one place is going to add Lowry seasoning salt and another place add Tony Sashers. You know, there is one line, one recipe, because it's already probably pre-cooked already. They're just heating it up here in our local stores. So it tastes the same. So what they were wanting for us to have this harmony as well. If we, if someone goes into any church or any of our synagogues where we're in fellowship, they should be comfortable knowing they are hearing the exact same thing, the same goals and aims, dreams, and moving the body of Christ and God's kingdom forward. There's not any um, big eyes and my mission, my aim, and my goal. That is not the intent. So we should be comfortable, and that should be everyone's desire. But as I said, we are humans. And that's when conflict arises because everybody may have a different idea or an opinion how we should do that. And unfortunately, we began to see this here in our lesson. We're going to emphasize Numbers, the 13th chapter, chapter 14, Acts 15, and Galatians 15. And in the interest of time, I'm going to spot read on a lot, lot of this. So I'm going to read here. The early first century disciples and followers of Jesus were Jews. But this didn't last long, for Jesus commissioned them to go throughout the world to spread the good news of the gospel of this kingdom. We see that in the first chapters of Acts, um, Acts 2. We definitely see that. Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And there were dozens of different countries there. Well, what are they doing? These men, you know, that... Um, are they, is this new wine? Now, we heard them in one language. Now, all of a sudden, I can hear them in my own language. And then Acts 2 begins to give an account of all the nations that had come together for Pentecost, but they could hear them in their own tongue. So this is when we first see the gifts being manifest here. Um, we see in the first chapters of Acts the varying ethnicities and cultures coming together by faith. Now, with all of these ethnicity, ethnicities, ethnicities, cultures, traditions must somehow blend and meld together to make something cohesive to go forward in God's plan of his mission through us, purpose and discipleship using us. And think, just think of America, how we now we got that um, we've been coined the melting pot. And we've got so many blended cultures. We've got everything. Now we have Spanglish. I mean, you talk about a mixed culture is definitely what we are. But unfortunately, when you get um, very strong characters, dominant uh, characters in leadership positions, um, sometimes that can be unhealthy because you are coercing and pushing your ideas and agendas forward. And those who maybe have a weaker um, character, they're just not one confrontational um, they're not interested in that in any way. Just kind of go along. And unfortunately, that may not be healthy for whatever club or society, group, church or organization that that might be. If everyone isn't on the same page and fall, yielding to what God is desiring and wanting to do in his church. So let's go to the next slide here. Opinions, opinions. Everybody has an opinion. Dissension, conflict, disagreements are a part of any group or council or church. When each person has their own ideas, goals, and opinions. When you're deviating from what God has already set in place or you think this is how he, he wants you to get there and this other person has a revelation and this is how he's told me we ought to get there, then of course you're going to have a conflict and divisiveness, unfortunately. Your opinions might conflict with five other opinions in any group setting. So we definitely maybe can identify and experience that and work. Um, some people prefer coming in 6 to 2.30. Now, if they made that mandatory, I would be very upset because now I you 20 years ago, I'd love getting up at 5 o'clock or 4.30. Sometimes I'd get up at 4 and like I'd get up and go to Walmart when I was in Fort Worth, um, get my shopping done. I could come back home, have my coffee, and then get ready for work or whatever. Now, I wake up and I'm like, oh, no, because of sleep apnea, I don't get a good night's sleep. So when I wake up, I'm almost as tired as when I laid down earlier, you know, it's hours and I'm up every 30 minutes. So I'm tired. So they would say me every day at six o'clock, I, I might think I have to find an, another career. 
So my tour is 8 to 4.30. And then there's some 8.30 to 5. And some are 5.30 to 6, 7 to 3.30. So you have a variety even in, in our job. So there are different uh, opinions. And this is how I can be most productive and help um, the veterans that I serve. If I can have a tour, and the VA thankfully has been accommodating with that. People have different schedules. As long as you put your 8 in and your 40 a week on that. And if you're going to deviate from your tour, just let let someone know that I'm going to change my flex time today. It'll be 7.30 to 4 because I want to leave early for a doctor's appointment or, or something going on. So you will have those um, varying opinions. Strife. The author of Confusion and the Enemy of Our Souls thrives on dissension and strife. And he will use, my beloved, any means necessary to deter and detract the believer from the word and from faith in God. For our enemy, the greatest desire is to draw us away from God. And he doesn't care whether you follow him or not, just as long as you give up on following Jesus. That is what happens when we we come together and we're unable to reason. Um, let's talk about this. Um, you have a mediator or a moderator. You, this is the person, point of order. This is why everything mostly done in our, when we have a, a official board. You do it in a setting that uses the Roberts rule of order. So everything is done. You conduct. You have a marshal. So they, they, there be no fighting and that type of dissemination or assault happening. You have point of order. Somebody is speaking. You have to follow that and you have to allow that person to give their idea or how they see this going forward. Then it will be your turn. You cannot override and over talk someone else. That's why a lot of people don't like jury duty because you you don't... you. Sometimes you're not able to go through all of the evidence because you may have two strong personalities from the get-go. As soon as the judge and the courtroom, everybody go out and they lock and seal you in that room, they make it plain in the very beginning. I don't find this person guilty, so and there's nothing that you can do to change my mind. So now you've already thrown the gauntlet down to how you feel. You've let it be known. You're not going to look at now. We have a chance to look at the evidence Maybe they didn't say all of the evidence in there, but here we have the evidence before us. We can make that decision, and that's what we're to do. Is this person guilty or innocent? So when you have somebody like that and, and intimidating or trying to change someone else's from the not guilty, they saw it in this way. There may be three or four that see this, but a stronger personality sways them instead of less reason. Let me show you by this evidence why I look at this way. So when there's confusion, what ends up happening is people like frustrated, whatever. I don't want to be a part of it. And before, before you know it, <coughs> you've got hurt feelings. You've got anger, a bitterness going in. The person eventually maybe leaves this church. And then sadly, they leave in this church. It's awkward trying to start and go to another church because then everybody's asking you or looking at you because they know you were over at this church. Now, how come all of a sudden you over at this church? So unfortunately, they just stop going anywhere and just go online or they may start out in another town, but the travel is too difficult, a hardship. They're just not going anywhere. That is what we do not ever want to happen when we're dealing with conflict resolution or strife or disagreement in our church. Very important that we nip this in the bud. Let's talk about it, reason, hear both sides, and see what can, how we can make the best conclusion and decision out of this. Resolution. It's important that strife be dealt with immediately in the body of Christ. In any of our assemblies, we can become so divisive that we may say things that cannot then be unsaid. Hurt feelings arise, and before you know it, people are leaving or starting a new work elsewhere or not going anywhere. This is not how we should use God's gifts in us to grow His church. Again, this is His church. This is His will. This is His gospel. We have the privilege of sharing and expressing that and telling others about this, this grace. It is not ours and not a hell that I bled for you on anywhere. 
It's him. And it's all about him. And we forget that sometime when we're in business. and Our minds kind of make that shift over into the carnal. And forget that uh, you're supposed to be all the time, everywhere, and in all places spiritual. Not just Sunday at the 11 a.m. time. You in here frying chicken and in here, um, you are spiritual in here while you frying chicken with us as well. Because we're doing this to advance the kingdom of God. So it's always God-focused and God-minded, God-oriented, or you do run up against envy and strife. For where envy and strife are, according to James 3.16, there is confusion and every evil work. So fear not. I'm not saying that we have to be doormats and just allow anything to happen because that's what Paul is telling them and berating them about lovingly in the book of Galatians. When he's talking to um, this country and this letter is going out, how, how quick is it that once you were spiritual and you believed that you know you were saved by grace, but now all of a sudden you're going back to the law, you're putting restrictions and bondage on people that they're frustrated with. Ain't that the exact same thing Jesus fussed at the Pharisees about? Y'all put so many hardships on people with these other rules, and you no longer have people following the law that God said. You have set your law, your what you think is right and how to be righteous before what God has already written what is to be righteous. And you're starting this all over again. He's like, Lord, today. So let's show one example here. Let's go to Numbers 13, 26 to 33, and we'll spill over into like maybe Numbers 1 through 5. And I'm going to spot read through this. I'm not going to read all of it verbatim. Numbers 13. Uh oh. Let me, where am I here? Uh oh. All right, here we go. Numbers 13, 26 to 33. Then Caleb silenced the people. Okay, the backstory, you know, they were they were here. Moses sent out 10 spies, go into the land of Canaan, um, search it out, kind of spy it out. Let us know what kind of land it is, the soil. We're uh, uh, sheep herders. Um, what type of grass, we, is there enough room? We have all this cattle. Can the land support our cattle? Food for them and also that we'll need wheat that we can plant, you know, olives. What type of fruit is here? Um, the water, do we have water resources where we can build? How far will we have to travel if we're going to make a city here? How far are the water sources for us? So those are the things that he was wanting him to go and spy out. And, that's, and also uh, the cities, what type of people are there, the cultures, what will we may confront going. So then they would have to think of what type of delegation that they would have to mediate as we go and meet these nations or come together. And this is what we'd like to happen. We're going to be here. We'd like you to be a part of us. Um, this is why we're here. This is God land. So they could move in with not having any type of wars or confrontations. And you know, most often that does not happen. Anytime you come in trying to call and take somebody else's country that they have assumed has been theirs for thousands of years, you're going to get a fight, unfortunately. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses. They had come back, ten, um, they came back. And Caleb and Joshua had one report and the others had another report. Silence the people before Moses said, now we should go up now and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it because a God before us who can be against us. He's like, we can do this. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. And they said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there were of great giants. They were the and they were descendants of the Nephilim. So they had that spawn hybrid genome still in them. So these were some very large people. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our in our eyes, and we looked the same to them. Then chapter 14, that night all the members of the community they raised their voices and wept aloud. Uh-oh, okay. 
The Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron and all those in the assembly and said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in the wilderness. Why did he bring us all the way out here to let us fall? My woo, 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 woo. Now our children are going to, you know how we do. When we first, any type of opposition, God give us a word. There's a rhema. This is his desire for us. We see what God wants to do. And immediately, of course, your adversary is right there to put a roadblock in front of you. And I mean, out the gate, we 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 can't look at them and roll our eyes. But been there, done that. I have done the exact same thing, unfortunately. And, you know, instead of oh, you know, Lord, but Lord, make a way before we even get that. Now we've complained and cried before we then settle ourselves down and take this before the Lord. So this is what Moses and Aaron they fell face down in front of the whole. Israelite assembly, Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Yefuna, who were amongst those who had explored the land, they ripped their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, now two weeks ago, we talked about that. How do we please God? With our faith, it is impossible to please God. Nabs in Hebrews. If the Lord is pleased with us, meaning if we are walking by faith, trusting in God, he brought, we, we, can, we still have sand in our shoes from crossing the Red Sea. Don't forget so suddenly what God has done for you. But the next conflict that arises, it seems like we go into this amnesia. We seem to forget everything that God has done previously before this. And he's saying, if he, the Lord is pleased with us, we've already seen this. He'll lead us in this, into this land. He told us this is where we're going to be. And true enough, it's a land flowing with milk and honey, meaning there's nourishment that can sustain our crops and our livestock and us. And there's going to be plenty. And it will give it to us. But do not rebel have faith. Don't doubt. This is how you rebel against the Lord. Do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid. He's saying it again. Do not be afraid. So we have to squelch sometimes that fear in us. We have to just take a deep breath Calm down, especially in the, if there's a meeting or something, change is coming about. And the first thing that we throw up as a defensive wall, well, that's not how we've been doing it. I mean, that's the first attack that comes. The, the, you know, well, we've always done it like this. That's the first arrows that begin to come out. When anything is new, different, it's going to take me out of my comfort zone. I like routine. I like order. I like things done the same way. And often that's why people, when they move, they um, love the AME church. It's going to be the same. You're going to have a doxology. It's the same. Now, how we sing it, praise God from whom all bless, or praise God from whom, it doesn't matter. That's going to be the same. When we pray, how, when you, the prayer, the songs, the text, uh, reading the Decalogue, they're comfortable with those. They, they like that. Uh, so that I don't have to learn a lot of things new. I have that foundation, and this is just continuing what I already know. So when you come in a meeting or agenda and you have new goals, aims, intents, and ideas, automatically you have a blowback. You know, I, we, we're just too small. We're not going to be able to do that. We just can't afford that. We All these we can't, we can't, we can't. Instead of we've got to take this before God. I can see this happening this could this definitely is part of God's plan, but we have to pray that He open up our understanding and reveal to us how to make this work. That would be the better way for us to do to deal with that and to start out with any anything that we are faced. Uh oh, what did I do here, Harris? It is not uh oh. Well, I guess I messed up those slides. Okay, now let's go to Acts 15. Sorry about that. I got there and I don't know what happened to the to the words on that. Uh oh, I'm definitely sorry about that. All right, so I'm gonna spot read here. Let's go. We're going to fast forward. We're going to Acts 15. Now we're going into the first century. We were there about 
that was about 1750 BC when they were going into Canaan land. So now we're about, let's see, maybe 40, 45, 50 AD is about where we are now. And before that, Paul and Barnabas had gone around and we find out the different cities that they were going to. So now they were coming here back to Antioch. And this is, I believe, around Acts 14 and 27. Now, when they had come and gathered the church together and they reported all that God had done to them. And he had opened the doors of faith to the Gentiles. So they stayed there a time with the disciples. Acts 15 and 1. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. Now, the first thing you see here. Now, one beautiful thing about this, they're not stoning them. You don't see the type of conflict that we have seen earlier. It, it's still going to be there and it's still going to come up. But you don't have people in um, Syria coming down and stirring up. Not in this conversation, I'll put it that way, because they still do that. To rile those Gentiles up to begin attacking them. Because see, that's what the enemy uses. He has you come in and riding and attacking. You lose your focus. All of a sudden, y'all start y'all arguing. That's not even on the agenda. How did we even get to this topic? So when you don't have that um, order in conduct, have somebody mediating or silencing, you will have your turn in a moment. Like a judge will say, he'll stamp that, stomp that gavel, you know, and you know it's time to be quiet or the deputies are going to escort you out. This person has had the opportunity to complete their thought or their goal that they're presenting, then you will have that same amount of time. But we're so much, so spend so much time now thinking how we're going to counteract this. We're not really listening to see, well, what can I pull out of that? What can I draw from that? That would um, really uh, behoove and really help us at that, at that time. So we see this right here on this one. They're, they're just saying, well, we don't want to make a decision on this. Now we're going to send you all up because you, we want you to go before the elders. So this is what they had done here. Let's see, where am I? I think maybe if go to the Word document, it might look better. If you've got that in front of you, you might can see that. So I do apologize. I, I didn't paste that very well in the PowerPoint. And so go over here, or even your Bible, which one here? Um, we're being converted. Said, so let us go up and we'll take you all. We need to go before the, um, the council. So Paul and Barnabas accompanied some local believers to talk to the apostles and elders about this question. The church, which was in Jerusalem, they sent delegates to Jerusalem and they stopped along the way in Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers. They told them, much to everyone's joy, that the Gentiles too were being converted. So this is a great time that's happening. However, now you're going to have all these um, these cultures and expressions um, coming together in a clash. And there is no recipe and there is no one way to do anything in the word of God. They're not going to give us step by step. This is how now in the 21st century, here's how we're going to resolve conflict in the, in the 21st century. He doesn't give us that because they're ample. We've had ample teaching, training. We've gone to school. You've seen things at work in your own career. Um, you maybe have a daycare. You've had to deal with children, um, different feeding time. This one, you know, that's going to get cranky at this time. So you've had to become creative when you have groups of people there and how I can get my goal, get us moving forward in the, in the same direction. So how can I make that happen? So we're used to that praying and going to God. You got to show me how to make this work and God will do exactly that. All right. So Acts 15 and 4. Sister Teresa, if you have that in front of you, if you could read that, Acts 15, 4 through 8. I'll tell you 4 through 8. 15, 4 through 8. And when they were come to Jerusalem... They were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sects of the Pharisees, 
which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God which knoweth the heart bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. Oh, come us. on. Why is this going so hard? Okay. Alright, I'm sorry. I was trying to open a Word document and I don't know why this is just giving me this is just giving me the hardest time in here. Okay. Well, fully. I do apologize. Alrighty. Hang on here. Let me get back over here to over here to Zoom. I'm sorry about that. Let me stop the share because I'm Alright, let's stop the share. God knows the people's hearts, and he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. So we have shared that last week. What you began seeing here is Pharisees and those who are very conservative, they're still trying to put people into those same boxes, um, adding these same laws. So they're trying to put this works again. They're trying to bring, once again, this righteousness um, by your works. They're trying to do this all over again. And that's what we have going on here. And they're like, wait, Paul, like, no, wait, 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 wait. There's this, we just can't expect the uh, Gentiles to do because they're not Jews. This is what we've had, our, our custom, and this has been the law of Moses we've had for over a thousand years. Now we're finding out that yoke cannot be obtained. We now find that out through Christ Jesus. We cannot attain that. So he comes here to Jerusalem and they begin to count. Let's discuss this. Let's reason this. Um, not one person is taking over anyone else. If you notice how they're going to resolve um, this situation here. Verse 9. God made no distinction between us and them. Because God doesn't have favorites. He doesn't play favoritism. And this is how we are to be even in the body of Christ in the church. There's no distinction. So you're not elevating anyone else over some other person. For he cleansed their hearts through faith. So why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? Hasn't that just been revealed to us as why we were in need of Jesus? Did he not point that out? This is why we need a Savior. Because there is no one righteous, no, not one. And not one person could fulfill all of that law but this one man. So now why would you make them have to go through what you already know doesn't even work? And everyone listened, verse 12. Everyone listened quietly. As Barnabas and Paul told about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. We don't see here written any arguing. They were presenting the evidence. We're going to show you the data, basically. Let me show you. When we do this, this is what happened. And this is what Peter had said earlier. Remember in Acts, I believe, 8, he had gone to Cornelius. And he said, well, what is presenting you all from being baptized now? And baptized his whole house. Because remember Peter had that dream and that um, um, a picnic cloth had come down in his dream and a vision. And it had on there, it had chitlins, it had some neck bones, it had sausage and bacon, stuff that's um, shrimp, stuff that he was forbidden to eat, Old Testament law. These were things that they could not eat. Pork is one of them. He's like, no, Lord, I cannot eat those. But God was showing him, I'm going to send you to a person. He is not like you. He doesn't follow these customs. But you're going to see that I'm going to save him the same way I did you without this person being a Jew, without this person keeping the laws of Moses, but by his faith in me alone. 
That's what that dream and that vision was preparing Paul for. And he actually said that I perceive God is not a respective persons because they were thinking they were going to have to be in a separate room. And he talked to them behind a cloth because they cannot come in contact with him or Peter would be unclean according to Jewish custom. He had that revelation and ah, now I see what God was trying to show me um, with those crab legs. I see. And now Paul and Barnabas are expressing the same thing. They were not this. They didn't grow up in the faith. They're not of the tribe of Judah, um, Benjamin, Simeon, but by faith. So this is when they're coming together with what, what they're bringing here. That's it. Everyone listen quietly. Verse 12. Okay, verse 13. When they had finished, James stood and said, Brothers, listen to me. Peter has told you about the time God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for himself. And this conversion of Gentiles is exactly what the prophets predicted. Because remember, what was Abram? Where was Abram? He was in the land of where Ur of the Chaldean. That's north of Babylon. That's like northern Iraq. Um, I mean, right at the border of West Iran. Uh, there were no Jews then. There was no Hebrew then. There was no... Uh, children of Abraham, all of that was still in, in his chromosomes, in his sperm, still in his body. They were Gentiles. God called him out of that. So this is what he's he is sharing here. And God said he did the exact same thing to the Gentiles. How do you think the Jewish nation came to be? By Abraham's faith. And that's how he became righteous before the Lord. Afterward, I will return and restore the fallen house of David. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it so that the rest of humanity, listen, the rest of humanity might seek the Lord, including the Gentiles. All those I have called to be mine, the Lord has spoken. He who made these things known so long ago. So who are we? Who has made us so suchy muchy that we want to put so many restrictions on these people, bind them up, shackle them when God doesn't even want them shackled like this. By faith and not by works is the way that we walk this Christian journey here. And so my judgment is that what I just, I think should happen, remember they're still in this resolving, they're trying to come to a resolution going forward because we need to be uniform what we're sharing and how we're going to build every new work, every new church that we go to, every new community, it's going to be on this foundation. So we need to get get it together right now. The first bishop here is James, and this is who he's been here before. And so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write and tell them to abstain from eating food offered to idols Basically, this is the Noahic law um, from Noah, because Noah was before Abram. There were laws, and the Noahide laws, and this is what this is. Apart from following the laws of Moses, of these and this, and the Sabbath, and you can't eat this, and this and that. So before that, there was the Noahic law, and that is abstaining from eating foods offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood, because Genesis 2, 3, and 4, the life of the flesh is in the blood. God, the blood is very important, and that's why you cook your food. You guys like, no, no blood, no blood. For these laws of Moses have been preached in Jewish synagogues in every city on every Sabbath for many generations. You know this. I'm just saying it in different way, but you know this. So what you know, it needs to now be applied in our present age, in our present situation. What we are doing now, we are the way now. What do we want the way to look like? What is God saying as we go forward? He's the one that's sending us forward. So how do we go forward? What do we say going forward? So this is how what they had come down to. Resolving this, that could have been a conflict, that could have been stoning, a riot, Something that could have turned really ugly. They focused on, on the word, what God said. What did we know? What are our past experiences having gone through this? What was that resolution? 
can those things work here? And this is how they had come to this. Then the apostles and the elders together with the whole church in Jerusalem chose delegates. They went to Paul and Barnabas to report this decision. The men who were there, Barsabbas and Silas, and this is what they read exactly there, verse 24. We understand that some men here have troubled you and upset you with their teaching, but we didn't send them. So we decided having um, come to a complete agreement. So we were in, in, in agreement to send official representatives to decide what's going to be the final say on this. Verse 28, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit. Wasn't that it sounded good to me? All of my group was in the majority, so it's good to us. They said it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to send us to lay no greater burden on you than these few requirements. Abstain from eating food offered to idols, from consuming food, blood, or the meat of strangled animals, sexual immorality. If you do this, you will do well. Farewell. Then the messengers went out at once to Antioch, and they had a general meeting of the believers. They shared this. There was great joy throughout the church, and they read it, and this went forward. Judas and Silas, both being prophets, going forward, <coughs> sent them back to the church with a blessing of peace. <coughs> so in closing, any time that there is a conflict... Our aim and our desire at the end of this is for each of us going away still with the blessing of peace. We want to have everyone to be engaged, to be a part of the conversation. Um, we want to hear everybody's point of view because I don't have all the answers. You may see where you want us to go and sometimes a leader will do that. But we don't really know all the steps how to get there. And the rest of you, Leroy and Teresa, Travis... And Michelle should have the ideas for getting us there. And now we all come together and take a piece of yours, piece of this. Then we all can agree on this one idea, this one aim. This is how we're going to go forward with the steps. And we can all leave in and having the blessing of peace. Paul and Barnabas stayed there, but then many others taught and they preached the word of the Lord there. So they continued going through that. And just towards the end of here, I just have some things that I had pulled off from, from um, the internet. Unqualified spiritual leadership. Um, here, unqualified leadership, they want to wreak havoc on a community of faith. Um, the joint duty of elders and deacons and the congregation is to ensure that those presiding in God-appointed offices of the church leadership are modeling the qualifications set forth in Scripture. Now, I shared that on Sunday. You know, those were the things that Paul knew going forward. And even us as pastors, elders, and our bishops at the end, of, in the beginning of a church conference, these are the things that they look at. Who is going to be the best fit for Peter's Chapel? Not that I'm picking and choosing um, favorites. I receive letters from these different churches. I may, may, may have to make some moves. But I think I could see this steward now in a position of Sunday school superintendent. Or now I could see this person in hospitality on a prayer and intercession. Because we're all praying and looking for how can we, according to scripture, build and build up the, um, the body of Christ. Go make disciples. Teach baptize. Those are things that our aim and focus should be, not to wreck and tear up the church. Our ushers, you trustees, stewards, you have that same responsibility. Don't let anybody come in here and wreak, come in here and tear up and wreak havoc in your church. You know what they are saying definitely deviates from the word of God because that is the aim of strife from the enemy of our souls. Strife. Strife can arise, I'm at the, let's see, what, this is page five. Strife can, quote, strife can arise when believers are making significant achievements together and threatening the enemy's strongholds. So, of course, that's when he wants strife and division to come in. He wants to put a wedge between anything that will move God's agenda and God's people forward brings more people to faith because he wants the exact opposite of that. It can also develop when a difference of opinion becomes the primary priority in a relationship and one or both parties refuses to consider another person's viewpoint. And according to gotquestions.org, strife can alienate 
friends, divide families, and destroy churches. And um, most of us can attest to that without sharing any personal testimonies. I believe each of us can identify with something like that in our own families. Sadly, think about when losing a loved one. And now all this family you hadn't seen in years, they start coming out of the woodwork when Big Mama passes away because everybody knows that Big Mama had a will uh, down at um, Kaysen's Law Firm and had given a copy to uh, Big Low Funeral Home. I'm just saying names out here as an example. Um, so they want to know where they are or how I can ingratiate myself with the top the top five who I know going to be blessed. Now, I need to now um, align with them a little more so me and my family can ride on those coattails and be taken care of as well. So we, we have experienced and we have seen those things. We've seen the bitterness, um, aging loved ones and power of attorney when you have to make those decisions. And when there's money, property, estates, land and title, um, a part of that, you lose sight of the intent of this. Why did Big Mama or why did Grandfather do this? So that my family will be taken care of. There will be a legacy. All that I have built up that God has blessed me to have is not going to be squandered away. I'm leaving, but I don't want to leave you without anything. And isn't that what Jesus said? I'm going away, but I'm going to leave you a comforter. I go away to prepare a place for you. Leaving, but always having you on his mind. Letting you know, I, I'm going because I have a place still prepared for you, giving us promise, giving us hope, not just to see the loss that we're having today. I go to prepare a place for you. I'm not going to leave you alone. I will send you the comforter. Now, isn't that wonderful? So even in our meetings and our aim, we want to make sure that the presence of the Holy Spirit is there. We're walking in wisdom and being guided by the word. If we need to table something because cooler heads need to weigh in and some of us just may be frustrated right now and we see we're about to lose control of this situation, the wheels are falling off the train, let's table this at pause and we will reconvene this meeting, this point of this, um, two weeks from today and we'll come back when maybe we've calmed down, we've researched it a little more, had time to sleep on it. Well, you know, I went... I, I mean, I just went ballistic in there. But, you know, now that I think about it, those steps that she said of doing that and calling those, that's pretty reasonable. Um, that wouldn't take more than really 30 minutes in my way. I'd have to take off work. I'd have to drive over here. I'd have to do that. But, man, you know, now that I think about it, that would be easier. That would be most beneficial for all of us. So when we step aside and see how is this going to benefit all of us and know that God's not going to be in this type of confusion, then we can come back and we can finalize whatever it is we're wanting to do to advance God's kingdom. So we're going to stop right there. So in closing, does anybody have a thought on that or uh, any experience that you want to share without anything being too personal? Per so how you've been in places where maybe a a strong, um, somebody with strong, dominant character has kind of taken over a meeting or something. Um, how did you feel when those type of people came into the meeting? And I'd be like, oh, Lord, here she, holy, here she come. That, that That's me. I try to catch myself, but sometimes it slips out. Uh, you may have experienced that, too. So anybody want to unmute right now and share that? <laughs> 